Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, I appreciate the effort you've all made to be here. And uh, I understand we're also being broadcast live on Northampton Community Television. And also the North Street Neighborhood Association is taping the meeting. And there are some cards up here. Uh, you're welcome to pick up a card later, which will show you how to look at this online if you'd like to review it or show it to someone else. So, as I guess you all know, we're here to talk about stormwater. Can't hear me? No. Your mic's not on. Uh, they're telling me the microphone's not on? It's on. Um, I just don't have the speaker big enough to project the whole room. All right, so you're having trouble hearing me in the back? Wow. Usually I'm too loud. <laughs> All right. So we're here to talk about our stormwater infrastructure, how we currently pay for it, the kind of expenses that we can foresee coming up over the next several years and well into the future, and how the city should cover these new expenses moving forward. Uh, I'd like to take just a moment all of us, even those of us who are working with this on a fairly daily basis, sometimes get a little tangled up, like, well, doesn't the sewer fee pay for this or something? If you were to stand on a typical street, there are three sets of pipes below the pavement. Water pipes, sewer pipes, and the third set is the stormwater pipe. Now, all around the city, along the edge of the pavement, next to the curb, you see the catch basins that take runoff from storms and snow melt, and it just disappears into the ground where it's carried away by pipes, and the water is dumped into the nearest brook, stream, pond, river, any low spot that we can move the water to. We collect it on the streets, discharge it in the low points. As you can imagine, there are rules about this sort of thing. And in fact, we are required to have a permit that's issued by the state DEP and the EPA. It's called an MS4 permit. The other part of our stormwater flood control infrastructure is a levee system that wraps around the southeast corner of the city. The dikes down by the bowling alley, it wraps up by Pomeroy Terrace, and there's another set of levees that run along the Mill River down by the Smith College physical plant. <laughs> All of this infrastructure, I'm told, has a value, a replacement value, that might be in the neighborhood of a quarter of a billion dollars. This is a lot of infrastructure. Traditionally, we've paid for any of the expenses related to this out of the general fund. Our property taxes go into the general fund. The money's used for police, fire, schools, general operating expenses, and our flood control stormwater infrastructure. As budgets have gotten tighter, we haven't been spending as much money as we probably should have been spending. There has been a lot of deferred maintenance. What's happened recently that it has exacerbated this is that the Army Corps of Engineers has told us we must do some upgrades to the flood control system. They're not asking us to make it fancy, they're not asking us to expand the system. They're asking us to keep it in good working order. And the EPA permit for stormwater discharge is expected to uh, create a whole host of new expenses for the city. Uh, if you think about these catch basins along the curb, they want us to clean out the Dixie cups and the motor oil and the junk down the bottom of the catch basin. They want us to street the sweeps, to sweep the streets after a winter of sand and salt so it doesn't just run down the catch basin and into the nearest stream the first time there's a rainstorm. Fairly reasonable requests, but the scale that they want us to do it on is proving to be more expensive than anything we've done in the past. So that's the, the nub of our problem, and the first part of tonight's presentation will be presented by Ned Huntley, the director of the board of the Department of Public Works. He's going to explain these, this infrastructure in more detail, and he's going to explain the requirements that are coming down to us from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Environmental Protection. So, Ned Huntley. 
Thank you, Jerry. Hopefully I can project myself loud enough so the back row can hear from here also. Yes, that's good? Okay. So to start off, this is a small presentation that we're going to have on the flood control and stormwater utility proposal that we're forwarding to City Council in the very near future. Um, just so you know, this little picture here is the, there it is. Uh, that is West Street or Route 66 at the Smith College Physical Plant. That structure was erected during Hurricane Irene in 2011. It's only a partial erection of it. I think they built about six feet or about 14 feet of the wall to prevent the Mill River from coming into the city. Next. So these are infrastructure challenges that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we have flood control and stormwater, as Terry Green alluded to before. Uh, under flood control review, um, the Two systems were created in 1940 in response to the floods of 1936 and 1938. Um, they're both, uh, one is the Connecticut uh, River levee system and pump station, and the other being the Mill River levee, pump station, and river diversion. And this is a diagram of both of those systems that Terry talked about and I just talked about. This is the Mill River diversion. This is Paradise Pond up here at Smith College. It comes down through under West Street, where we saw that flood control structure, and then it follows a uh, river diversion channel and floods out or comes over a drop structure underneath the South Street Dam, which is by K what was Kaylee Motors. And from there, the river di diversion continues all the way to the Oxbow. Um, the other part of the system is the uh, Connecticut River system, starting at Homer Terrace. It comes down around. And this is the flood control pump station, which is located at Hawkman Road at the wastewater treatment plant. And then it continues and wraps around and comes down into the meadows down off of uh, Fort and Springfield Road area. This diagram is the area subject to flooding if the flood control system was to fail. And what it shows is an elevation in blue here, elevation 127. The flood control dike system itself is down here, and the top elevation of it is 130. So this is an example of three feet under, if the system failed, how far into the city this would flood downtown area if that was to fail. This is a picture of the flood of 1936, the Pleasant Street here, this is a Strong Avenue coming in. And this was the downtown underpass, the Zulu's restaurant is here and the uh, truck eating bridges, we so call it. <laughs> and this is, that's, this is one of the things that prompted this to be done by the federal government. Um, in 1938, we had additional floods. They weren't quite as bad, but after that, they started building the flood control structures all along the Connecticut River in Massachusetts. Uh, this is Connecticut River in 2011. We just went through that. That's uh, down in the Oxbow area. Uh, that was from uh, Hurricane Irene. That was uh, about elevation 118 the Connecticut River went to. Just in relation, if the Connecticut River gets up to elevation 120, it starts flowing over the uh, road at Route 5 at the bowling alley. So there's only a couple feet difference there between that critical uh, elevation. Uh, we did a little GI's property values. If it was to flood to elevation 127 downtown, and based on the 2012 data, there was about 100, almost 200 uh, billion dollars and property that would be affected and building values of $54 million that would be affected in a, a, a flood not quite to historic measures that we've seen in the past. This is the Hawkman Road pump station. This is the back side of it. Connecticut River is down here several thousand feet down. These small gate valves are not small. Large gate valves in the back here uh, flap open when the pumps go on. And um, this is the flood control building itself where all the pumps are. And like I said, this is located at Hockman Road in the back of the wastewater treatment plant. This is inside the pump station. There are three engines like this that have the capacity of pumping 150,000 gallons a minute total out of the city. Um, <coughs> what happens is the, the old Mill River bed, as it used to be, is a source of collection point for a lot of the downtown. It flows into a cavern here, gets sucked up by a pump run by these engines, and is pushed out through the flood control wall into the Connecticut River. So 
So this is a, a, a simple diagram of how it works is that this is the historic Mill River bed coming down. Uh, the Mill River used to flow through the center of Northampton and it was diverted as part of this project. And what happens <laughs> when the Connecticut River gets high, it can't gravity flow out the pipe system. So we have to turn on these pumps and pump the stream bed or the old Mill River bed through the flood control wall because of the rising height of the Connecticut River. It also works in reverse of that is that when we have these deluges of rain where we see two or three inches of rain in five hours, the Mill River is low, with, or the Connecticut River is low at this point, but there's so much water backing up in the Mill River bed, we have to turn on the pumps just to push the water through to get the water out of the city. So it works under local events and also under regional flooding events. As I said on, a, on the first screen, this is the flood control wall of the Mill River. Uh, that was uh, put up during August uh, 2011 for Hurricane Irene. Um, the river came from about two feet from actually touching the bottom of the wall. It's the most I've seen since I've been in the city, and according to reports I've heard from uh, other people in the DPW, the last time it probably was put up was in 1955. So now we have these flood control mandates that have come down from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, like I said, the Army Corps of Engineers built these flood control systems for it, and they turned it over to the city of Northampton with the agreement by the city that we would maintain this system forever. So what they mandate is that we do now is these new engineering studies to look at, is it sturdy during an earthquake? Uh, do the hydraulics still work in it from 70 years ago when it was designed because things have changed, the Connecticut River's changed, uh, they want to make sure it's stable, it hasn't settled much. They're looking for surveys and some borings to start the engineering work on that. Um, we have two deadlines we're working off of, and actually the Mill River just got extended to January 2014. But we have two deadlines that we're working off of, uh, Mill River uh, system and then the Connecticut River system. We're estimated it's about $1.2 million in cost to do the engineering work and the low-level maintenance construction work. Once that engineering work is done, we'll be able to describe to us better what other future needs we're going to have to do to repair this facility if it needs repairs or upgrades to meet modern standards. Uh, like I said, we don't know those future costs right now, but we do have a pretty good handle that the $1.2 million would have covered the initial engineering studies and some of the uh, required maintenance work that we're looking at doing right away. And um, we also have a mandate on the pump station right now to the cost of about a million dollars that they want us to undertake right away. Then we have our stormwater drainage system. Uh, it keeps the roadways clear, water and ice, as Terry described earlier, provides, uh, prevents localized flooding, and minimizes damaging erosion and protects our infrastructure our infrastructure being our roadways, water lines, sewer lines, and uh, property. This is a map of the outline of the city of Northampton and its roadway network, and you can see the Connecticut River here coming in. And if we go to the next slide, you can see that there's 4,800 catch basins in the city of Northampton. Granted, there's a huge spine of them along the interstate system that are not our responsibility, but it shows the magnitude of how many of these infrastructure collection points are within the limits of the city of Northampton? Um, that we're responsible for is about 114 miles of pipe, 190 culverts, and numerous drainage channels across the city. If you go out to, um, let's say, Kennedy Road, there's drainage channels on the side of the road that go to culverts, and those have to be maintained also. And those outfalls, we have 326 of those in the city. So an outfall is where maybe a street collects and discharges to a wetland or a brook or a river that Terry talked about earlier also. And that's what we have to turn outfall for. So we have maintenance responsibilities for these 326 outfalls too. We have a very old stormwater system. Um, a lot of it is over 100 years old. The system is under capacity in a number of areas. Uh, some city areas don't have a drain system and need improvements. And we have very limited funds for replacing, repairing, and construction at this point. This is a picture of Main Street during a heavy rainstorm. You can see the water boiling up out of a, a, a manhole cover. Um, it was quite a deluge, but this is what is showing that we have 
under capacity in our system to handle reasonable storm events. This is a picture of North Street at the underpass, uh, just past uh, Dunkin' Donuts. It does flood on a fairly regular basis, uh, but it is and has been identified as a problem that should be investigated. Uh, we all know that it goes down in sh in a, a few hours after event, but it is something that does happen. This was off of Hatfield Street, where we actually had one of our uh, discharge points blow up the bank, uh, create quite a an erosion problem, and this is an exposed gas line that was part of it. This happened in uh, 2011. This is an older collapse on uh, Prospect Street down just below the water department. Um, there's an old, probably about 150 year old stone culvert that runs underneath the road. And this was a collapse that happened in the side of the road in a person's front yard and that failed. This is a undersized system we had up on Florence Street that couldn't handle the rain and it blew up and destroyed the roadway. And we ended up having to replace a good section of the drain pipe up there also. Uh, this is a chronic flooding area also down the corner of Elm Riverside and Milton, just below Northampton High School. And this picture is in back of the Ryan Road School in Austin Circle. There's also chronic flooding issues on a regular basis. So now we're going to get into the new EPA mandates that we're looking at. Uh, the, basically, the EPA, they issued, uh, they issued five years of permits. We completed our first five-year <coughs> permit. We're about ready to have delivery of our second five-year permit. There are a lot of new regulations and uh, issues we're going to have to deal with. So basically, the EPA permit regulates the discharge to the brooks and streams. We expect the permit sometime late this year, if not early next year. And like I said, it will be a five-year permit. And this new permit drastically increases the cost for our stormwater system. One of the mandates is more frequent catch basin cleaning and monitoring all the basins to ensure that if they get over 50% full, they have to be dug out or sucked out with a vector truck. Right now, we hit the ones or we go after the ones we know are chronically filled on a regular basis, and then we do the other ones as we can. Uh, we basically have one person driving around pretty much three quarters of the year doing this on a full-time basis. This is a vector truck that we purchased a few years ago to help speed up that process. It's also used in the sewer system for cleaning sewer lines and working with uh, sewer maintenance. So this truck serves a dual purpose. This is a picture of one of our two street sweepers. Underneath the EPA mandate, we're going to have to do uh, two times a year sweeping. Currently, we do one time a year sweeping, and we do additional sweeping downtown on a regular basis. So there's an increase cost and maintenance and labor and equipment needs for that also. Under the mandate, we're also required to do um, sampling of the 326 outfalls to ensure they're not discharging um, bad water. We do find occasional sewer hookups into the drain systems still. We find those, we have to correct that issue or the property owner has to correct it if it's on their land. But one of the permits is that we have to do this sampling and analytical testing, and then I believe it's a period of 60 days when we find something wrong to correct the issue. Part of the new mandate is green infrastructure. You've probably seen the stormwater quality swale in front of the uh, Daily Hampshire Gazette building on the side of the road. This is also recently incorporated with the North Street Reconstruction Project, and we actually worked with the Smith College Picket Engineering Program this past uh, year and developed a green infrastructure database and hopefully a plan moving forward where we incorporate green infrastructure on a regular basis on road reconstruction projects. A couple other things the mandates are is public education programs we have to provide, illicit discharge detection and elimination. That has to do also with the, um, the sampling of the outfalls. Uh, nitrogen reduction and discharges we're looking at. Uh, this is why the green infrastructure is being put in place help filter out some of the contaminants in stormwater before it goes into the system to go to the local brook or stream. And uh, we have to complete a municipal floor drain inspection in all public buildings and make improvements as necessary for illicit connections. 
The last thing I want to talk about was river and brook erosion threats, which are not part of our stormwater system, but they're part of our city property and things that we have to do. Like I said the first cap is uh, we're blessed with very beautiful streams and rivers in the area, but we do have stream bank erosion issues that we're trying to deal with. We currently have no funding sources for those at this point, but we're aggressively pursuing grants from FEMA to correct at least two of those as we speak right now. And we have some pictures of those, I believe, after this. This is one of them, the River Road retaining wall. River Road runs from the Leeds Post Assault over to the Haydenville Town Line. And there's a river or a flood control retaining wall there. And this is a pretty good sized hole that came out of it. And if you drive along River Road, you'll see that the actual wall is undulating as it's falling into the river. We have a, uh, a $1.6 million request to the federal government through the Federal Emergency Management Agency to repair this wall. Uh, we've had a city council appropriation through the capital improvements of $400,000, which covers the 25% share that the federal government requires, and the federal government picks up the other 75% of this. So we should be finding out about that project, hopefully in the upcoming months. Uh, this is the Federal Street retaining wall, which is down below Ward Avenue and Vernon Street. Um, you can see the large voids that were here. We repaired this, uh, I believe, about five years ago. It is starting to fail again. The, the wall is over 100 years old, and it's, um, it's a stone retaining wall, and the back of it is a 30-inch sewer interceptor line that carries most of Florence down into our wastewater treatment plant. So we're concerned about this, this project also in the future. Uh, this is on Roberts Meadow Brook, just below Mizani Beach. Uh, this is an erosion. The, the river is trying to make its new path. We have also have a FEMA grant in for this, a request. And this is about a $500,000 project. Uh, we believe it's going to be funded in the upcoming month or two from the federal government. Once again, it's a 75-25% so the city needs to come up with about $140,000 to secure the rest of the money from the federal <coughs> government. So this is the flood control mandates that we're looking under right now of both stormwater and flood control. Obviously, we talked about the Army Corps before, requiring engineering studies and maintenance to repair for the Mill River and Connecticut River systems. And we're estimating it to be about $2.2 million over the next three years. We have the EPA stormwater permit mandate that includes increased operation and maintenance costs, estimated about an increase of about $425,000 a year. And then we have these river and brook erosion repair projects that we're trying to find alternative funding for. And with that, I'll turn this back over to Mr. Colleen for the budget. Thank you. Have uh, most of you noticed the handouts up here on the table? The first slide is a budget of what we're spending now and what we anticipate spending in the near future. Uh, we should have copies for almost everyone. It might be easier to follow along if you had a copy to look at. Do you want a copy? Yeah. Oh, it's not. Don't, we don't have this? Do not. I'm just wondering we have. Uh, never mind. Bill never mind. There's an introduction to Bill comparison. I apologize. Right. We don't have it. This will be online tomorrow by about 11 in the morning. We have three columns of numbers here. I understand you can't see the numbers. As I say, it'll be online tomorrow morning. The first column details what we're spending this year, what the city is spending this year on stormwater and flood control combined, all wrapped into one package. Basically, the number this year is about $335,000, the first number there. This doesn't include any of the mandates that Ned just explained to you. 
doesn't include any of the engineering studies the Corps is asking for. It doesn't include any of the upgrades for the MS4 permit that the EPA will be requiring. The additional street sweeping, cleaning the catch basins more frequently, the education component, that sort of thing. So 335 is today's number. Next year, if the MS4 permit kicks in 100%, and we're not sure, maybe it comes out in February, maybe it's March, maybe it's, we have to see. But we expect that once the MS4 permit is issued, it's going to increase our expenses on the order of 400,000 or a little over $400,000 per year. The numbers are really daunting. Um, for example, we have 4,800 catch basins. If the city wants us to look at every catch basin at least once a year, you do the math, if we work on this for eight months out of the year, 40 hours a week, we have to get to a catch basin every 17 minutes the whole time. No lunch, 17 minutes per catch basin, and we can just barely get to every catch basin once a year. It almost certainly is going to require that we have two crews doing this, not one crew. Two trucks, not one truck. So it's along these lines that we can forecast exactly what would happen if we have to meet these requirements, what the costs would look like. The other piece in here is the work on the flood control system. Again, they're asking for engineering studies and they're asking for the beginnings of some work on the levees. It's going to be in the neighborhood of seven, Pardon me? <laughs> it's going to run along at a rate of about 250,000 at first, and then it will ramp up as we get into these projects. As Ned mentioned earlier, the Army is extending the deadlines. They know we're working on this. They know we're having meetings like this. We're trying to figure out what our next move should be. They understand, and they're being very nice about letting this go. As soon as they sense that nothing is happening, I think they may change their tune. But for the moment, they're letting us figure this out, work it through. The big thing that's new in the budget that we're proposing is we're proposing to put aside $500,000 a year for capital expenses. This is putting in new, new pipe in the ground, working on something at the pump station, putting in new catch basins, the sort of thing where it's not, not manpower, but actual construction money. Um, just to give you a sense of what we're spending now, uh, a couple years ago we spent $225,000 on North Street. You know, we repaved that whole section of North Street. It's about 4,000 feet of pavement. And the city, through the general fund, paid for the stormwater pipes. The water enterprise system paid for the water pipe. Sewer enterprise paid for sewer. The city general fund paid for the stormwater pipes. $225,000, not a bad amount of money. That's a pretty expensive piece of infrastructure. It sounds like a lot. If we keep that pace up and we spend $225,000 every single year putting in 4,000 feet of pipe every single year, it will take over 140 years to get all the way around the city and get back to North Street again. 143 years. That sounds like we're spending an awful lot of money, and it's clearly not enough. On the sewer side, we put aside three or four hundred thousand dollars a year for infrastructure expenses, and it seems to work out pretty well. Our budget this year, in the present city budget for infrastructure in stormwater and flood control is zero. Last year, zero. Year before that, zero. And even when it was funded, the usual funding was $63,000. We've just been deferring maintenance on all of this stuff, fixing problems only when they occur, doing very little to be proactive 
about taking care of this stuff. So my point here is that the, the $500,000 is for all flood control stormwater capital expenses. If we need a new engine for the pump station, that comes out of the $500,000. If we have to tear up parts of the levee system to repair the tow drains, that comes out of the $500,000. It's a lot of money. We get that. But it's not a lavish budget. Going back to North Street just for a second, you might say, okay, well, we spent two twenty-five dollars last year. What's the previous expense? It was in 2007, we spent $50,000 on Ridgewood Terrace, and before that, we spent $125,000 on Crescent Street. In fact, the two twenty-five dollars we spent on North Street was on the high side of what we're typically spending. So this is what's driving our problem. If we tackle the expenses that we're going to have to tackle to meet the Army Corps of Engineers requirements and the MS4 EPA requirements, it's going to require spending more money than we are accustomed to spending here in the city. Getting that money out of the general fund is, is hard to imagine. It's just, I, I've said this before in meetings, it's, it's hard to imagine going to the city council and saying we think we should lay off some teachers and a policeman or two so we can do something on the levy system. These are just inconceivable conversations. So earlier this year, the city council appointed a task force to look at this problem and explore what this task force believed would be the best way to fund our problem. How should we address it? Should we, use the, could, should we continue to use the general fund? Is that going to work? Uh, and I think the task force quickly decided that probably was not going to work. By the way, I meant to say, the task force was comprised of uh, individual members, each appointed by one of the city councilors. The mayor appointed a member. The Board of Public Works appointed a member. And this was a truly a cross-section of people across the city. Uh, these were not fanboys of um, some kind of an enterprise fund. I think, in fact, this group started out to be somewhat skeptical of the need for an enterprise fund or a fee of some kind. So they looked at the general fund. Does that work? They considered, could this be done with overrides? Maybe every time we have a project that needs to be done, would it make sense to schedule an override? How about a new stormwater fee, some kind of an enterprise system? such as we have for water, sewer, and solid waste. And finally, maybe a combination. For example, the city of Westfield instituted a small fee. It was politically expedient. It was a tiny fee. Not, people didn't get too worked up about it. And it's a combination of that fee and the general fund. Although, unfortunately, the city has found that this is not sufficient, and now they're trying to figure out what to do. But that would be an example of a combination of a fee and the general fund. <clears throat> so the task force delibered, deliberated for actually several months. They, they, I have to say it was very impressive. They met weekly for several months. Uh, they really dug into this in a very impressive way. And they came up with a series of recommendations. It was, in fact, their recommendation that establishing a fee system would be the most practical way to cover our needs in this, in this area. They felt that every property owner should get a bill. Uh, that was a, a general principle, I think it's safe to say, of what the task force came up with. They thought that the city council should definitely have final say over whatever the budget is for a given year. Uh, they also said, as a corollary to that, that they thought it was important that if a fee is going to be instituted by the city, that it should not, that the fee should not go up, or at least no more than a tiny bit, over the first three or five years. The other thing the city spent a lot of, the task force spent a lot of time working on was the issue of how do you determine the individual bills for each property? If the budget is X amount of money, how do we figure out what the bill is for my house for your house, for Cooper's Corner, for Stop and Shop, all of the properties around the city. 
the task force came up with a couple of different models. They were look, I, I think I'm, I'm summarizing the task force here, and I, I hope if members of the task force uh, care to correct me or modify what I'm saying that they'll speak up later. But I think it's fair to say that they favored a fee structure that looked at the totality of the property, not just the pavement, but also the unpaved areas in a property. Uh, one of the models they came up with they called hydraulic acreage. The other one is called equivalent residential units. These are two methods of assessing the stormwater runoff characteristics of a property. The task force agreed that we should standardize the fees for smaller properties. Uh, there are 6,600 residential properties in the city. And on any given block, every single property is almost a cookie cutter size of its neighbor. And frankly, the houses don't vary that much either. It made sense to standardize across the residential properties. <coughs> The task force had some concern about balancing the impact of the fees. They didn't want to shift the fees to the commercial sector in such a way that it was unfair. They're trying to balance the commercial sector charges with the nonprofit charges, with the residential charges, and keep the overall balance of these charges at what everyone agreed was a fairly reasonable level. I mean, it might seem simple, but they shifted all to the commercial sector. But that wouldn't that wouldn't work. It just it's not a would not be something that everyone would feel as a fair approach to this. <laughs> Finally, they felt there should be a system of credits and incentives so people can, if they're motivated to do something to reduce or eliminate the runoff from their property, they should be have an incentive, a credit available for that sort of work. Late in July, the task force presented their report to the city council. On the 15th of August, the city council thanked them. Uh, it was very, it's a strong, it was a, a strong thank you, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. They, they did a lot of work for this. At that point, the city council passed an order asking the Board of Public Works and the Department of Public Works to take the task force's presentation and use it as the basis for building up a proposed ordinance that the city council could consider, an ordinance that would build the case or make, uh, build the structure of an enterprise system for stormwater and flood control expenses. The city council asked that the hydraulic acreage model, one of their two billing systems, be used as the basis for the proposed ordinance. They had some other, they recommended that the credit scheme be investigated and implemented. They, um, if there were going to be any caps or minimums, the city council asked that we be prepared to explain our reasoning and what we had in mind and what the impact of these uh, exemptions or minimums or caps might be on the overall uh, system. So the task force now, by mid-August, has stepped aside. Now the Board of Public Works is working. <coughs> we took the report from the task force, and we, we basically made four substantial adjustments, or the four prominent adjustments. We modified the runoff coefficients slightly. We combined two runoff coefficients from the hydraulic acreage model. This is all in the... All of this is online. Some of this is probably in more detail than you want. After much discussion, we decided to unify all of the residential properties into one rate. With a, if you assume a $2 million annual budget, which was a number we were using as a target number, the average residential property in Northampton would have a bill of $123 per year. We also looked at and considered breaking residential properties into tiers, like under half an acre, half an acre up to one acre, one acre up to two acres. It did make mean that smaller properties got a noticeably lower bill. Under half an acre would be about $85 if we were to break it up into small tiers. 
Larger residential properties, however, would be up over $300. We, we came up with the unified rate of 121, 123, that we thought that made sense. It's open for discussion. This is something, if the feedback says no, it's important that we have the smaller breakdown in the tiers. It works either way. We are not married to any one aspect of this model. This is what I'm describing for you represents our best current thinking. The planning office has been talking to us on the behalf of the conservation and agricultural commissions. They're asking for some kind of a special break for comp uh, properties that have been placed into a permanent conservation restriction or a permanent agricultural preservation restriction. It's worth taking a moment at this point to talk about the, the cost for open land. The task force was concerned about charging by the square foot. Someone with 30 or 40 acres of farmland would suddenly be looking at a pretty substantial bill, even if the cost per square foot was a fairly low number. So in an effort to, and everyone agrees, agricultural land and open space is something we, that's desirable. This is something we want here in the city. We certainly don't want to penalize it. So the task force decided that the charge for open land would stop at one acre. Half an acre would be half of one acre, but two acres, it's still an acre. 10 acres, you pay for an acre. 50 acres, it's an acre. So the maximum charge for open land is the charge for one acre of land. As I say, this was an attempt to make sure that open land wasn't penalized in this system. So that's by way of perspective. Still, the planning office is arguing that properties with permanent conservation restrictions, permanent agricultural preservation restrictions, ought to get even more favorable treatment. Does the $100 go down to $50? Do we just let go of the $100? It's being debated right now, frankly. It's not quite pinned down exactly where that's going to go, what our recommendation would be. If you circle back to the task force, they felt that every property should get a bill. So maybe it turns out to be $50. It's, it's being discussed right now. Finally, and as you can imagine, this is the big one. We think that the city, this, now when I say we, I'm talking about the Board of Public Works, Department of Public Works. We think the city should get a bill. The task force at one point voted that the city should get a bill. At another point, they voted that the city should not get a bill. And some other discussions were kind of in the middle. Chamber of Commerce has gotten involved with this, and a number of prominent citizens throughout the city have gotten involved with this. And if I could summarize their feeling, the city is currently spending, as I pointed out, about $335,000 on this area right now. If we put a, an enterprise fund into place, does that money just go back into the general fund? The argument that these people are making is that the point of this fund is to generate additional new money to pay for what we have to take care of in the flood control stormwater areas. The point of the enterprise fund is not to allow the city to stop spending money on this area, rather to supplement that. This is the case they're making. The city pays a water bill. The city pays a sewer bill. And the argument was the city ought to pay a stormwater bill. That we need to be very careful intellectually to keep these two things apart, the general fund and the enterprise funds. I have to say, no one was making the counter argument, or at least no one seemed to be coming forward. I think emotionally, we all feel like, well, heck, the city can't afford to be paying this. The city's strapped for money. But no one was actually coming forward making an intellectual argument that demonstrated why the city should not get a bill like everyone else. And I'll assure you that people who thought the city should get a bill were working very hard to make sure we saw their point of view. In the end, I have to confess, I was personally persuaded 
that they, they, had, they had a lot of good points. So at the moment, the BPW, DPW proposal is that the city will get a bill just like everyone else. So they've got some stake in this process. This is not a, a free lunch for the city where they won't care what happens. They're in this just like we are. So again, we took the task force's output. We consolidated two billing mechanisms into one. We said we're recommending a standard fee for all residential properties. The other 2,600 properties, the non-residential <coughs> properties, we will calculate those bills property by property. I guess I, I'm way off. Oh, am I? I'm on it. <laughs> uh, we'll calculate the other bills property by property using aerial survey data the assessor's office records. We're looking at total property areas and the amount of impervious surface on these areas, on these properties. <coughs> City Council will set the annual budget and then the mechanism for creating the bills just turns the crank. You put in X number of money as the annual budget and the bills come out the other end using the formula as laid out by the task force and as slightly modified by the Board of Public Works Department of Public Works. And we're in agreement, the task force recommended no increase for five years. I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think the department has a problem with that. It seems like a reasonable idea. Now, we do have a handout for sample bills. I'm sure everyone's a little bit curious about that. Basically, this handout here, I think many of you have this by now, shows what the bills would look like for typical properties around the city. Cooper's Corner, the Clarion Hotel, Hotel Northampton, CVS on King Street. You're welcome to look through that. It's a fairly good example of what this would look like for the average property or a residential property owner. Smaller residential properties would wind up paying about 41% of the total charges. Larger residential properties, condos, rooming houses, four family and larger houses, would pay about 9%. The total bill for commercial properties, up and down King Street and all over town, about 23% of the total. City property bill would account for 9% of the total budget. And then all other forestry, open land, uh, agricultural, about 7% of the total. This $1,900,000 at the bottom of that page, that's basically using that $2 million, like let's just figure it for $2 million. If we said plug in $1 million as the annual budget, all of these numbers would be reduced by 50%. So it's just simple math at that point. Once you agree on a formula, you just plug in the annual budget, the numbers come out the other end. That's it. Last thing to talk about is what happens from here. The Board of Public Works is working toward finalizing our recommendation. What you're hearing today is a snapshot of where we are now. We want to get the word out, make sure people know about this, and we want to hear your comments about it your questions, your comments. We, we need the feedback. We want to get everyone engaged in this conversation. Once we are done, which I hope will be around the end of the month, all of this information will be passed along, along with a draft, a proposal for an ordinance, will be passed along to the City Council. At that point, they'll begin their own process. There will be other meetings like this. There will be subcommittees, like the Ordinance Subcommittee on the City Council, who will be reviewing all of this information. I think there's a finance committee on the city council who will probably be weighing in on this. At that point, the city council will determine the process moving forward. So we're near the end of the BPW, DPW process with tonight's meeting and the next couple of weeks of work on this. I think that's it for the presentation. 
And now we'd be happy to have questions. Uh, I'm assuming you're, you're looking at $121 here for household. Uh, and and I, I'm assuming that, that when this is built out, that uh, it will be built out like the water and sewer built out by the quarter. So the homeowner would be looking at $30 a quarter. Yes. Our intention is that the billing would occur if this goes through, if this happens. Our, our thought is that we would hire a billing clerk and we'd send out monthly bills staggered around the city. People would get quarterly bills of approximately $30 per quarter uh, and they would be sent out with water and sewer bills. Um, what I had in mind, if people would uh, come up, maybe line up here, and if you please introduce yourself and pass the, pass the mic back as you... Uh, uh, because I was here in Florence. Uh, in all this presentation, I didn't hear anything about the word bonding. Uh, all right. Now, some of these infrastructure projects are big right. items. Are we just going to pay for them off the shelf, or are we going to prolong their payment over 10 days like we do with other... We're imagining that the $500,000 set aside every year for capital expenses would cover borrowing and cash expenses. Smaller projects, we might save up and pay cash. Larger projects, obviously, obviously we'll have to borrow money. Okay, one other thing here. You said the city is currently spending $350,000 a year on this type of expense. Yes. Well, now they're going to get a bill for $176,000, which means they're getting cut at their contribution. Yes. Yes. It's, it's calculated the same way as everyone else. Uh, I, I, I think that we're trying to make it fair. We're trying to make it come up with a system that sounds logical, that seems logical and straightforward. And as it happens, it's true, the city's bill will be lower than what they're spending now. All right, and one last thing. We passed this override during the last election. <laughs> Not all of that money got allocated. Some of that's going into a slush fund someplace in the city. I, I really don't know. <laughs> so I'm more in the DPW, BMW. Where's the cash going? That's the question. You know, here we're picking up $175,000 of less obligation to stormwater. We've got an override bill that only a million dollars of it gets spent, and another million dollars gets put away somewhere. Yeah, well, that's that's what the citizens are going to be asking. Right. Where is the money? Thank you, uh, John Gals, the 20 Ward Avenue. Uh, do I understand correctly that the final authority for adopting this is just an action by the city council in approving uh, this ordinance? It does not require a vote of the citizens. That's my understanding. It's just the same as the water enterprise fund, the sewer enterprise fund. Thank you. My name is Allison Kurbisky. I'm at 23 Ice Pond Drive and president of the Ice Pond Homeowners Association. And I would like to bring a subject up that I notice on your list. I know it's just a sample, but I'd like you to consider the homeowners associations who are required by the city to maintain stormwater facilities. Our neighborhood is 24 families. Six of the households are uh, living houses that are part of the affordable dwelling unit program of the city. And so 20% of our residents are living in affordable dwelling units. Our annual dues go, we spend nearly $2,400 a year to maintain stormwater facilities. And I think when you're talking about credits, you need to look at the category of the homeowners associations in the city that have that kind of responsibility. Because if you add $123 on top of our annual dues, our community, our 24 families, are spending a great deal towards stormwater management. We have three contractors that I need to unmanage. And this is a large responsibility. We also, it's another idiosyncrasy of the Ice Pond neighborhood, which is a part of the redevelopment of the state hospital land. We have individual property owners who, when they bought their property, were required as part of their purchase to buy conservation land. 
I own a piece of woods that has a conservation deed, a conservation restriction on it. It's an outlock that I was required to buy when I bought my property. So I just want to point out this nuance. When you're calculating land area, you need to look carefully, particularly on Ice Pond Drive. For those of us, I think there's six households who own conservation land. Because we don't want to be billed for conservation land. Just some thoughts. And I have a handout. I'd like to leave the gentleman up here. If I could just say a moment, uh, something quickly about credits and incentives. An ordinance would re would make mention of this. The ordinance will not be so specific. It will say rain barrels will be fifty cents or whatever you know the particular incentive may be. Um, I view the incentive and credit issue as an ongoing issue. Years from now, we'll, be, we'll still be finding new things that work really well. Maybe we've realized that something we've been doing for a while doesn't is not doing what we had, had hoped it will do. <coughs> it will be a moving uh, target over the years. Just as water and sewer, we, we couldn't always have foreseen what had to happen. We, it's something we can work out as we go. There will be credits, and I think your idea for the Homeowners Association is a good one. Terry? Can I say a couple words? Yes. Um, well, well, actually, which maybe? Well, just on this particular okay. subject. All right. um, Chris Hellman, who was on the Board of Public Works. I'm on the Board of Public Works. I'm also uh, served on the Stormwater Commission. And I spend a lot of time thinking of the credits and incentives question. This is a new one that we haven't really covered before. Um, but I think Terry is right to point out that this is a situation where it's something that's going to be evolutionary in its scope. We're going to be looking at it. Um, I'd love to get a copy of that handout because I think it's something we need to, we need to consider. The uh, gentleman sitting next to me was also asking about uh, pre-existing stormwater mitigation conditions, another thing that we want to be looking at. So uh, this is an area where we put a lot of thought into it, but it's also quite, quite a bit in flux, and we'd we love to continue to get your feedback on it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, my name is Robert Nagel. I live at Three Menace and I'm new in North Carolina here. Uh, the annual flat, wait, uh, flat fee of 123. Well, what is a standard property then? The intention is that if, if, if it's a residential property, <coughs> that's the fee. Any residential property? One to three family. One to three family. Where are the uh, 6,600 properties that have been deemed a standard located? Throughout the city. No specific, no specific area. There are residential properties on virtually every street in the city. Okay. So, but that's why. Thank you. I'm not trying to be confident. No, I, I, I understand. I think this tax is wrong. I, I will continue to drive. I think it will continue to drive the middle class out of our city. What is fair and equitable about the, this taxing of the size of our roofs and driveway? What is fair and equitable? That was quoted by the <clears throat> Well, I don't see anything fair and equitable about this. What we hope will be fair and equitable is the distribution of the expense. We if, if I may. I, I, this may be helpful. Um, so we have these federal agencies saying we have to spend some money. They're being fairly specific about what they want us to spend money on. Excuse me, part of the Army of Engineers? Army Corps. Army Corps of Engineers. The Here's ones who let New Orleans and, it, and I have to say New Orleans, well, let, me, let me finish, please. With, with lack of levies, right? I understand. So now they're trying to catch up. To cut on, the, on our backs. Hang on, but please let me finish. In 1938, the City Council, in November of 1938, the City Council authorized the mayor, William Fiker, to sign a document making an agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government. And the deal explicitly stated, we it's under a category called assurances. We assured the government that if they would build this levy system, which we desperately needed, we would maintain it in perpetuity. Now, they have hardly been terribly fussy about this. As a matter of fact, they've left us alone for decades. 
but things are falling into some disrepair. And at post Katrina, admittedly, they got caught asleep sleeping in Katrina, but the government is trying to catch up now, getting communities who've made these arrangements to work on improving and bringing these things up to uh, current I don't standards. Think that's fair. I think that's we something. have one of the oldest flood control systems in the state. It's the second oldest in the state. There are only about 25 systems in the state, about 25 communities have flood works like ours. Ours is one of the largest and it's the second oldest. And I would say over the years we've done pretty well with this. It's, uh, we haven't had any major flooding since the we haven't had trends of rainfall as we did a couple of years back. They just had them in Colorado, they had them in Vermont. In Colorado, Colorado, Vermont, not Vermont. Vermont. It's just a matter of good luck. There's a big difference. I understand. Okay. As far as the EPA, there are no federal regulations saying that we have to collect stormwater and discharge. But if we're going to do that, they do have federal regulations. And we either follow the regulations or we stop collecting stormwater. There's, there's no middle ground. The relevant chapters in the EPA regulations are called failure to comply. And the penalties for not complying are draconian. Just insane penalties accruing by the day. We don't want to get into a struggle with the EPA about whether we have to do this or not. I don't think we win. <laughs> and this tax, once again, will be voted on by the city council, right? Yes. We like to call it a fee. fee. It's a tax. It's not a fee. You think of it as a fee. It's a tax. <laughs> from West Farms. Uh, I've got a farm out in West Farms and it's made up of like five or six parcels. Does that mean I'm going to get a tax bill on each single parcel? No, uh, we've, uh, we know about this issue, not you specifically, okay. but there are a lot of farmers, for example, down in the meadows who have little patchwork of uh, parcels. And uh, our current thinking is to, once you've paid one fee, that's it. As long as it's common ownership, um, you know, if you had a parcel and your daughter had a parcel and your niece had a parcel, that's a different story, but one owner, one fee. All right, and the other thing is on the credits. I mean, when they redid West Farms Road, they had two drainages that come off that hill that drop into that culvert in the, the bridge at the bottom of the hill. I don't know if you with it. But the city doesn't have time to maintain it, so all the debris goes down there, and if I don't have time to clean up the debris, the brush and stuff, I mean, that culvert gets... And you know, sometimes that water is just about going across the, the, the brook. I mean, is that something I maintain? Is that something that would be tuned to the credit? Or just let it go and flood the road? Well, hope, if, if, if we have a budget, maybe we can take care of it. I, we'd have to. I mean, I try to clean up the debris, but I mean, sometimes the brush and briars in there is just too much to get cleaned out. And you can see in some of these storms that water just about going across the road. We have to work that out, but I, I hear what you're saying, and I mean, that would be our intention to take care of that. Hi, I'm Cindy Morgan, and I live on Straw and on Florence, and I would like to quote something you had said earlier about um, a lot of the city in Florence lots are like cookie cutters of. On a given street. Right. And um, the. Standard $121 that I'm going to be charged for my property as a one um, family home. What about the people that I see that have these big, huge, huge homes mm -hmm. with big, gigantic driveways going up to them and have large yards and obviously have the money to maintain their property? and pay the taxes, where do they fall with this $121 fee? It's a, it's a good question. And, and we, here are the two sides to it. On one hand, just a flat residential fee is easy to explain. Well, it fairly, doesn't but, pay my taxes. I understand, I, I understand. Okay. On the other hand, we could do the graduated 
by size, under half an acre, half to one, one to two, and then you get a distribution that would be like $85, $120, $200, and, and $350, depending on how finally you break it down. Well, it seems not fairer than this arbitrary 121. If the, if the feedback we get from the city councilors and the city but their favors... But the city councilors have only their one property. I am the only um, person, the only income for my property. Mm -hmm. Most of these people that live in these big, huge houses have multiple incomes. So you, are, you would argue that we should have the finer gradation? Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You've got to consider that because of the number of elderly people who are moving out of the city mm -hmm. because they can't afford to stay here anymore. And we just did the override, which mm -hmm. is going to um, increase our taxes every okay. single year. It is based on last year's tax. The percentage is going to be the same based on that year. So the next year's tax is going to be a larger percentage, and so on and so on. We just can't do it anymore. And how many more of these fees are going to be put on us because the city can't afford it? And like that gentleman said, well, the city is now getting their fees cut in half based on your um, ratios. Because we gave them the money from the override. Why should they now have a sale price where we're having to char be charged more? All right. I, I hear what you're saying. And, and the... So you make a good argument as to why we should have finer gradations on the residential. We're still, it's, it's still open for, it's still up for debate. Okay. It, it's, it's still open for discussion. This is, the bit, the cake is not baked. Danielle Powers, I'm on Starter Street, Northampton, and I completely agree with her. I'm single income, and uh, I've paid, I've got, left with the override that I didn't vote for and I don't I have a very small property and why am I paying for something that my neighbors have a larger property for and I can't afford it. I just can't afford it. I'm born and raised in this this city and so are my parents that are no longer with me and why am I paying for something that I can't afford? And I see larger properties all along down my street and I have a, a single single driveway and I have a smaller house and everybody else can fit six vehicles in their driveway and I can't. And I'm, I I want I agree with the tier system mm -hmm. and I just can't afford anything anymore. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. How about the means based uh, discount for people who there, there will be a, um, a means-based discount. Uh, the city has other agencies, other departments that have offered programs like this. We're planning to follow the same procedures for people who uh, have demonstrated low income needs uh, with a discount or an exemption. We haven't, again, it's being discussed. Uh, Mike Kirby, 134 North Street. Um, I'm a little concerned that the $2 million is seen to, that this will fund every year. Um, that about, I think, a million of it, about half of it, will go into these catch basin clearing and, and engineering studies and and the other million will go into projects. Is that about right? Yes. But if you look at the CDM report that uh, that started this whole project, you can see that the all by itself the pumping station, which is long past its service life with engines, you know, the 1938 engines, 
uh, that we're going to have to replace that. And the bill, CDM, would love to spend our money, and, it, and according to this, it, it budgets $15 million in 2016. So, the, the, the tariff is being put forward that it's not going to change in five years, for five years. But how can you guarantee that, that it's not going to change for five years if the engineers get into that pumping station and discover that we need to essentially build a new pumping station? <clears throat> well, we can borrow money, and I, I think it's fair to say we're, we're comfortable. We have no budget now. so. Frankly, the department's pretty excited about having a little bit of money that we can start tackling some of these projects. Uh, anything that we do at the pumping station would be years of planning, engineering studies. Uh, I don't think anything's going to happen overnight there. And it's still our hope. We're, we're, we haven't even been able to pay for the studies yet, but we're hoping that they'll we'll be able to replace the engines without tearing the building down. Now, we thought we could also replace the old trolley barn that the Department of Public Works uses for all of their vehicle maintenance. When the city's building inspector went in, he said, no, if you really do a lot of work in there, you have to meet, for example, modern seismic standards. Well, we don't think that brick building built 75 years ago would meet modern seismic standards. You mean the, the pump station? The pump station. We, we don't think we could put air handlers up on the roof. Right. To, you know, get these huge engines indoors. We don't think we could put things on the roof to, to exchange the air within that building in a manner that would meet current OSHA requirements. So it's a mess, and we're hoping we can. So there take still babies. may be an override in the future if they have major. Yeah, major I, an override has been discussed as one way to deal with a catastrophic, unforeseen. I love catastrophes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why well, we don't have a lot of time left. <laughs> Maybe she grow Abbott leaves. And um, I used to think that they'd get me out of my house with a crowbar. And with the cost of things, it, it makes it harder for me also to think about staying in the city. So I would like to see some way of getting some kind of credits. Um, I agree with woman that if you've only got a uh, a driveway big enough for a car. Um, the way the runoff is is quite different than, than somebody who can park six cars. So I would like to see that. And, and, and along those lines, I'd also like to see the city um, to take a, a proactive um, approach to um, stormwater runoff. And for example, when you talk about redoing Pulaski Park or a new building for um, the DPW, which is obviously needed, that you would take these things into consideration and that the city should become a leader in terms of um, uh, rain gardens yeah. and cisterns and, and these kinds of things. We would like to. That zero budget is slowing down what we can accomplish. Uh, Fred's in Knock Ward 3, and uh, I was a little bit surprised about this presentation. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, Camp Dresser McGee report has disappeared, or is that still on tap? It's, it's disappearing. I mean, it, the underlying uh, numbers in there still make sense. For example, that the flooded area below the bridge across from Dunkin' Donuts, that whole system along uh, Market Street is undersized. They think it's going to cost $20 million if we want to address that issue. Well, that number is accurate. Okay, as far so as we if know. If I looked at the, if I remember the camp dress and the heat, I report correctly, the uh, 20 year budget was 92 million. If we so, do all of those things, right, okay. Which but I mean, if you, if not you say it, it's, we're not going to do the camp dress and the heat, I, I don't see being able to tackle four $20 million projects in the near future. I, I suspect we'll have to live with that, that lake below the bridge. Uh, we've got much more pressing issues than that. Okay, uh, so Camp Dresser is disappearing. 
Uh, the next question I have is, uh, my property is a uh, commercial property, it's got four apartments. Mm -hmm. And I looked at some of the models that were in the uh, task force. And one of the parameters for the model is impervious area. So if I have a question about impervious area and I find that my impervious area is less than what you need, what you quote, can I get an abatement? Yes. There's an appeals process. I, I got so caught up in this, I wasn't staying right with the slides. There's an appeals process. If someone feels, these are the 2,600 properties that are not residential, where we actually measure the size of the property, measure the impervious area. If a property owner feels that there's been a mistake or there's an, been an error, you bring it to the attention of the Department of Public Works. Um, basically, we okay. want to get it right. Okay, the other question is uh, um, concerning uh, the enterprise fund. The fee is actually a service fee for removal of stormwater. Right. Is that correct? And flood protection. And stormwater. So, if my street is constantly flooded, do I get an abatement for the fact that <laughs> I don't know about the abatement, but hope, hopefully we'll have so some money some kind of reduction to do something about it. With respect to my fee, or no, with respect to your street. Okay, so if it continues to flood, it it won't make any difference to my fee, even though you're supposed to be removing the stormwater. We'll have to. Think about we'll have to investigate that. One of the things that I'm struck by is a parallel in some ways with energy efficiency uh, and energy use mitigation <clears throat> in homes. And I'm curious if there's been consideration about looking for ways to support actual uh, stormwater mitigation in addition to, incent to incentivizing, are there ways to actually help underwrite that? particularly perhaps preferentially for low-income um, homeowners. Does the EPA have the capacity to offer guidance and perhaps some funds? In, in the, uh, the budget, which was too small to read, there is $30,000 for mitigation projects, drainage, swales, that sort of thing. Um, at this point, we haven't pinned down how it will be spent. Um, we're looking for, and there's also $20,000 for education. Um, there are little pieces in the budget that would help us begin to address that sort of idea. Um, once there's any kind of a budget that we can count on and predict, then it's easier to consider the, the type of program that I think many people here in the city would love to see. So the second question is, if we're talking in fact about um, uh, on the ground infrastructure um, changes and improvements like bioswales and <coughs> rain gardens and so forth. Have we thought about the necessary training for the cadre of landscapers that serve in our community in terms of being able really to support them to offer this as a service? Um, Great idea. Well, that would be perhaps in that education budget. Yeah. There, and there is a fair amount of traction in our region and across the state as well as across the country around thinking about training and how to bring that workforce up to speed. So. Well, as Ned mentioned, the EPA is mandating that we spend money on education, and that would be a perfect example of where that money could go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Henry Ford. Uh, I live on Spring Street in Florence. I was also chair of the committee, the task force committee that did the report and handed it off uh, first to city council then to DPW. The first thing I'd like to do is to ask the members of that task force that are here tonight to stand. We have 11 people on the task force. They met weekly for three months and spent some considerable time thinking about this problem. So I am responding tonight on behalf of the committee, and as we did at our meetings, if I get it wrong, I've asked the members to stand up and correct me or anyone else that's appropriate. And I think the committee members will verify that's the way we ran our task force. So with that said, first, I would like to specifically challenge the idea of changing the red runoff coefficient 
I would like to see the data, the technical data that supports that change. We, the task force, had documented data to make that recommendation, and I think if you change that, it's incumbent that you produce the technical data to justify that change. It cannot be, it should not be done on the basis of opinion. It needs to be informed engineering opinion. Okay. Want me to respond to that? Uh, I thought you were asking for comments. Yeah. I was not anticipating that you would necessarily respond to all my comments. If you'd like to do so, that's fine. But that's, I'm not here to have a debate or a discussion. I want to give you some comments. Take them as you will. Second, I think the committee really felt that you should be as quantitative as possible in the formula, making sure that you were as detailed as possible and not lump things together. We also believed as a committee that all property produces runoff. All property, agriculture, whatever. After you have a substantial rainstorm, ground is saturated, if it continues to rain, you will get runoff from all the property throughout the city. That is a physical fact, and it cannot be denied. Secondly, or thirdly, we would suggest that you get the most up-to-date GPS data possible before you set the formula. Uh, there's some question about whether we have that data, but in this day and age, it's certainly possible to get. You said no one would stand up for the idea that the city shouldn't pay a bill. I am standing up and suggesting they should not pay a bill. Let me share the logic. If we ask the city to pay the bill, where will they get the money? The money comes from the general fund. Now, where does the money come to put in the general fund? The taxpayers do that. It seems to me this is simply circular reasoning. And I don't see a way around that. Finally, you passed out a table representing uh, what the average house might pay or some other institution. If that table does not include exemptions, then it is not a fair representation of what will happen in the end. And I believe that the table that you present to the public should take account of any exemptions. If you don't, taxpayers will have a substantial surprise when the exemptions kick in and they get the bill. And finally, anyone here who was on the task force, I invite you to stand up and make whatever comments you care to make or correct any mistakes that I've made. Thank you. So a couple of points. Firstly, uh, City Council asked us to use the .95, and if we didn't, they wanted a document explaining explicitly why we didn't use .95 for pavement. Uh, I think the task force can make the argument to the City Council. Perhaps they were incorrect in asking us to unify that. Um, I, I, I would suggest that would be a great thing to take up with your city councilors. Uh, and I've lost my other thought, but thank you. I'm Ken Lenz from 71 Reservoir Road in Leeds. I'm the owner and property owner of the first two houses from Roberts Meadow, New Zandy Beach. Could you please put up that uh, erosion picture that you have up there of Roberts Meadow? Oh, back, right there. That house belongs to me. <laughs> that erosion has happened since 1971. I started dating my wife in 1970. That's 30 feet that we've lost of that embankment. That has been brought to the attention of this city the last 15 years. And that's where it's gotten to. It prom also, I'm also a builder and a contractor in the state, licensed for 45 years. If we had approached it and taken care of it when we should have, forget City Army Corps of Engineers, forget EPA, 
Rip Rap would have taken care of it for maybe $50,000. Also, your other, my other comment is about this Army Corps of Engineers. They're also the ones that cost us an arm and a leg for the dam above that swimming area when they filled it and caulked it when they didn't have to because it was a leaky dam and all they had to do was go to the library to read about it while it was built. So I don't know how much I'm going to rely on the Army Corps of Engineers if they're not coming up with the bill and the check to pay for a lot of this. Also, from that house down to the road, at the bottom of it, my neighbor lives there who was my wife's grandparents' house and there's been a catch basin there since 1955 which the city has never cleaned out since 1955. It's 16 inch by 16 inch, four feet deep, and has never filled in from any sediment. You can't see it, but to the left of that house up in the woods, I built my house in 1977, but I built it correctly. My driveway had to have 1,600 yards of fill, and I used beach sand. So my groundwater does not hit that catch basin. Plus, the Conservation Board, because of Audubon Road being behind, behind me, required that I make a drainage area around my house. I actually have a 8 foot by 8 foot by 20 foot deep stone catch basin on the side of my home with an 18 inch perforated pipe that I use to water my garden, to water my lawn. It's all rainwater, which Mother Nature gives us for free. So that catch basin dumps whatever it does dump into the brook which is part of that brook right there. Um, so my questions are, if I don't really put anything into that catch basin, why would I be built in the first place? And I've got all grass on my lawn, so I don't put any sediment down in there, or it would have been filled up a long time before. So you're arguing that you should be exempt? Uh, yes, you I should You gain be. nothing from the flood control or the maintenance of the road throughout the city? There you go, that's what I gain, 30 feet of loss so far. Um, the erosion, also my father-in-law who lived and built that house ran your pump station for 18 years. Rebuilt those three pump, three or four motors in that building three times. Ain't nothing wrong with that building, ain't nothing wrong with those pumps. It'll pump anything the Mill River will give it to him. And I was down there, he was within six inches of that river overflowing the embankments at the 129 or 130 stage, I forget what those numbers are. He died in 89, so I haven't been there for quite a while. That's taken care of it all these years. And I don't see, never saw a problem with that building, never saw a problem with those pumps as long as they're maintained. Mm -hmm. We've had this system for 100 years. Yeah, everything goes with time. A lot of these people in this room, including myself, are going with time. We need to replace it. Um, we need to take care of it. Not everywhere, as I just mentioned, I guess. But the thing that I don't like is, Where's the money going? Who's controlling it? And for how long do we have to give it? It's just like the tolls on the mass pipe. We passed a law that says when it's built and paid for, it's only 8.30. It's gone. Well, four, four of them were gone and now they're all coming back. When it comes to politics and people that are running municipalities and states and federal governments, I'm really concerned. You're a skeptic. Yeah, I because I worked in the Pentagon. I was in the military for six years, and I know what goes on. And I don't like it. Okay, thank you. All right. Another gentleman. Fred. Yeah, Fred Zimnock again. The gentleman just brought something to mind. And uh, you're probably aware that I've been looking at the enterprise funds. And two examples <coughs> that we have are sewer and water. And uh, just by chance, uh, I thought I'd look at the sewer and water enterprise funds to see how they calculated their, their rates. And it all began when I went to the assessor's office to pay my tax bill. And I looked up at, I looked up at the wall, and all the water and sewer rates were there. So I thought if I had those, I could go back and calculate the rates for the water and sewer. Well, in order to do that, what I did is I took those water and sewer rates and I plotted them out. And basically from 1997 to 213, they increased about like 7% per year. So then I, when I went to Forbes Larvae, I looked at the last budgets for 212, 11, 10. I think 9 and 8 were missing, 6 and 5 were there. There was no way that I could tell from looking at those numbers 
what caused the sewer and water rates to increase at 7% per year. I mean, there's just no detail in there to tell me what was going on. The only conclusion that I could come to was it probably wasn't salaries that were causing those increases. That's a done deal, so it doesn't really matter, but you're starting another enterprise fund, and it's going to be expensive. The first five years are $2 million, but we don't know what's going to happen thereafter. So one of the things I wanted to point out that I forgot about is that there should be some way for the taxpayers to know where that money is going, how it's being spent, and it doesn't come out of the fiscal budgets. There's just not enough information there. So with the new enterprise fund, maybe you want to consider some way of tracking the expenses, you know, what's online. being repaired, how much is going. Well, I mean, the fiscal budgets are online, but you really can't tell that much where the money's going. I mean, they've got four categories, P, S, O, M, O, N, M, and what's the other one? And, but that doesn't tell you where the money's going or how it's spent. So if you want to do this enterprise fund, put something on the tail end of it so we know what's going on. I think everybody would feel better about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments in the room? Jerry, sure. I apologize. A joke that I worked for. Um, brought up a question about the, uh, you did mention, so I apologize for when the city council would address this. And uh, so I wanted to ask you to reiterate that. But also I just wanted to kind of make a comment. I don't know if you can expound on this, but I mean, I, my feeling is, is that really soon? And, and does the council, are they really going to take all of this information and, and are they going to rubber stamp it or are they going to actually listen to the people because there's so much good information. It's true. There's a real inequity when it comes to people who, uh, you know, have more that they can afford to and those of us that are being pushed out because we can't afford to keep up with all of these things. So my question, and, and this may or may not be for you, so I don't want to be unfair about that, but is, this, is the city council actually going to listen to this? And I'm sorry to say this, but I've seen them in the last few years as more of a rubber stamp group, and I apologize if anybody's offended by that, but I'm a taxpayer in the city, and I don't, I don't see that as being... Once, once you guys make an edict and you're doing your job, and I appreciate what you're trying to do here, Terry, uh, are we going to have any legitimate fallback from this, that, you know, for this information from the council? I think, so, I think the process moving forward, Councilor Casey, I think, would like to speak to that. But that's fine. It should be fairly robust, I would guess. And when is the, when is the time limit? Uh, we'll give our quick, what we have to the council in the next few weeks. So this is thing, a second. I, I will promise you I will not rubber stamp anything in the city council. <laughs> Period. Thank you. I can only speak for myself. Hi, I'm Rick Clark uh, in Ward 3. I was on the task force um, as well. And I want to address a couple of things and ask a question. Uh, I guess I'm in Ned, and I'm not sure of the budget when we set up the enterprise fund. Would it be uh, the, the current um, personnel and equipment and resources that are dedicated uh, to stormwater now? Would they be separated from DPW and assigned to this? this enterprise fund and then we buy new trucks and, and would it be a, a, a dedicated stormwater team or would there be overlap within the DPW? Um, currently the sewer and drain division work together underneath the highway super the highway department. So with that, there'd be no change in the personnel that I'm aware of or I'm thinking of. What happens currently now in the sewer drain division is that the salaries the on and budgets are separate between the enterprise fund and the general fund. But the salaries for the two that work in that division are split. Two thirds on the sewer system, one third on the storm system. So this would provide the funding for that one third of those labor uh, resources. And then on top of that, it would allow us to hire what we believe is going to require two additional staff members for additional workload from the EPA. The catch basin. So that's right. That we're not looking to create a separate stormwater division. Currently, the equipment is shared between the, those two groups, like the back truck can use in water and, and uh, stormwater. 
the, the clamshell bucket truck is really dedicated to cleaning catch basins, but it could clean out sewer manholes if there was a clog or debris in there also. Right. So, so we're not using huge changes in setting up a new division with a new foreman. I think it's already in place. It's a matter of making sure we have enough heavy equipment motor operators to operate the equipment that the EPA is telling us that we need to do this work with. So you would see uh, a minimum two more hires? We see in that budget a nominal of two DPW workers, uh, a stormwater person to oversee the whole program, and a billing clerk is currently what's proposed as new personnel. Um, the other thing I wanted to address was what Emery was talking about in the coefficients. Uh, and I just want to make clear that the task force were not experts in this area. Um, the coefficients were beyond the scope of our expertise. And I think it's entirely proper that you examine those coefficients. Uh, in fact, I'm concerned that the city council passed on this report to you without itself examining both methods that were recommended. And now you're facing um, a, uh, a method that is um, you know, raising the concerns that you're hearing tonight. There's, there's concerns with the other method as well, but I think that you, you knew and you probably anticipated some of these concerns with choosing this method. And I understand you didn't really have a choice if the city council instructed you to choose that method of the two recommended. So I just want to make that clear you know, from the outset, that there are other methods for arriving at what you're trying to do. Right. Okay. <clears throat> I, I, I think, if I, if I may, Rick, uh, the, the two methods for calculating the bill presented by the task force wind up in fairly similar places. The billing between calculated one way or the other winds up looking quite similar. I think, I think most of the task force would probably agree with that. And in both cases, they were looking at impervious surface plus another charge for properties that don't have a lot of impervious surface. Uh, so it's our opinion that the two methods really shared a lot in common. And, and I, I don't think, I think it's not unreasonable to pick one or the other. I think either one would work fine. Mm -hmm. One more question. My yes, last one. I'm assuming that none of this money in the new stormwater enterprise fund is going toward building the garage. Correct. That's correct. Okay. It's it's one of the um, advantages of an enterprise fund that segregates the money. They're legally required to do it. If I could just make one other sure. thing clear yes, about the two methods, I know, I'm just you know your uh, that one method is a is a fairly uncommon method of doing this um, this type of calculation. It's generally used in broad open spaces. The western states use this mm -hmm. method more in uh, Florida tends to because of its uh, low, the, the water level down there. And the other method that was recommended is used by over 80% of stormwater utilities. There are not that many of them, and over 80% have found that this works. So I would really consider to, to ask the city council to um, you know, look at the report mm -hmm. before they recommend one of the two to recommend you were a great proponent of the ERU. Yep. Uh, you, uh, John Skagiski. I did. I had just one question. Home offices, how is that going to be handled? Is that going to be considered residential? Say a single family house uh, that has a home office? That's. I, I would think so. Again, you, that's an interesting question, but I would Imagine that's residential. <coughs> I would assume that yeah. that would come under that category as, as a residence, not a commercial yeah. operation. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Just one here. Uh, properties in the floodplain on the other side of the flood control, mm -hmm. are they going to be assessed the same as those on the high side? Yes. So 
the airport and people going on for the drive? It's $100 a year with credits available if it's agricultural land or conservation land. Well, Northampton Airport is how many properties? Is what? Northampton Airport is one property or is some It's one property. One property. <laughs> If I may, uh, I'm Jim Dostal, and I was on the task force. Um, particular properties um, are subject to a good long look, and you say, you know, will they be charged the same amount of money? Um, I think you have to look at each and every individual piece of property here and assess it. Um, there's a little, little talk about the 6,000 uh, pieces of property being the same. I don't know how much you're going to change that. I really don't. Uh, it, it looks like something that uh, will work, and uh, I, I really think it will. Thank you. Jim? Uh, do you want to come up and use the microphone, please? I just wanted to ask Jim. The people at home can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> Jim, uh, will those take it from the air, right? Satellite photos. That's what they use, right? I don't know. Yeah, that's what they use. You didn't go out to each and every property. Correct. It's satellite photos. Okay. Or aerial, aerial photos. Oh. Satellite photos. That's yeah. what they're called. Thank you. Yeah, what they use. I'm going to keep shot, Jim. Go ahead. Take a shot. Good evening. I'm Chris Hellman. Um, I'm a member of uh, Ward 2. I'm also a member of the Board of Public Works, and I served on the task force. Um, so uh, we did a lot of thinking about this. I, I want to associate myself with some but not all of what Emery said. Uh, and I think that that's an important point to make. Um, there was no unanimity on any of the significant issues on this. This was a matter of discussion that went on for days and weeks, because these are hard issues. And that's why we're here. If they were easy, we wouldn't need it. That's number one. Number two, um, I want to speak specific, and I, I, I'm, I'm willing to talk about this with anybody at, at, at any time, but there are a couple of points that keep coming up that I feel need to be addressed. One is the so-called CDM report. The CDM report was contracted by, by the city to give us an understanding of the magnitude of our problem. I don't believe it was ever intended to be a blueprint for action. And it certainly was not viewed as a blueprint for action for our committee. So when you hear $92 million, don't worry about it. That's not what it is. What we're talking about is a steady stream of revenue that will be dedicated to dealing with a set of problems that we know are coming down our way. We want the stream of revenue to be reliable, which is why overrides were something that why we think they're probably part of it. We're not going to be the only answer to it. And we want people to understand that we will set the rates, or the rates will be set, if this is the way to do this, by our elected officials based on the demand for money and on the willingness for us to pay for it. Okay? And thirdly, the idea of the question of about how we were going to treat individual residences or three-family residences or single-family, however that was going to work, man, that was a buster. Okay, we were, none of us were happy with any of the discussions because we saw the merits on both sides. The last thing we want to do is see a new fee that's going to force people from our neighborhood to make financial decisions about their future in this community. That's not what we're trying to do. So if you feel strongly about that one, I, I, I urge you to talk to your elected officials. We were given a task. It was not an easy task. It actually ended up being a fun task and a really interesting one. And, and we learned an awful lot about not just the community, but the issue of stormwater and drainage and, and things like that. And you know, again, I, I will discuss any of the merits with you on any of these things. I'll, I'll talk about 1938 engines. I disagree with you on, on the replacement value of those, but that's, that's just me. But the point is that the great minds will differ on this. This is an evolutionary process. We're going to come up with a system that works, and it's going to change over time. And it's up to you to talk to us and your elected officials to make that happen. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I can address. 
Uh, hi, hi. Uh, David Keese. I am uh, from Ward 6. I served on the task force. I live in Florence. I own Northampton Plumbing Supply. I have a lot of impervious area, a lot of property, a lot of rainwater. I have a big house. I have a big yard. I have a big driveway. I probably should pay more. I'm not opposed to paying more. But sitting on the task force, this was all about what's for the common good. You can live in a thousand square mile piece of property, pay $121. But how do you get to the hospital? How do you get to the food store? How do you get, how do police come to save you or the ambulance come to save you? So when you talk about the common good here, it's not the size of the property you have, it's how you get to it. And I have to support this because it's for the common good. Now some of the things on, on the comments that have been brought up, I agree with. Some of the things that Terry said, I agree with respectfully, most of them. Some of the things that were brought up in the pictures were all selling the part of it that's bad. And we have been living with this for a hundred years. It's not going to be fixed overnight. Like anything else that we deal with, it's not going to be fixed overnight. But we have to start somewhere. But I want to change a couple of things that Terry represented. That budget was projected, $2.2 million. And he said, it's $121, $123 if it's $2.2 uh, $2 million. If it drops to $1.1 million, it's $60. But it's projected. If it goes to $4.4 million, it's $260 or $240. Don't lose sight of that. The, the city council has to deal with this. But we have 4,835 storm drains. We need 4,835 residents in here telling our elected officials what they need to hear. This is great to see this many people. We had six or seven people at this at those task force meetings. George, you were at every one. Thank you. We need 4,835 people. We have 6,600 properties. Those property owners need to be here to tell our elected officials what they want. It can't be from the BPW. It can't be from the, the task force. It has to be from us. And that's important, to bring those people. We have one meeting after an election. One meeting before it goes to the city council. That is terrible. Terrible. We talk about education. We offered at the task force that they should send out a brochure to everybody who pays. We offered that. It hasn't been done. And I offer today, if it's because we don't have it in the budget, I'll give you the money. I'll pay the stamps, and I bet you everybody in this room will help us mail those out. So every person who gets a bill knows what's going on. So they can talk about this from an informed viewpoint. So they can go to the city councilors, and they can talk to them with informed information. That's what we need to do. It's for the common good. It's for you, your neighbors, your children, and the people that come after, your parents, anybody. That's what we need to do. Would you, would you speak a little bit on the five-year cap that we decided to put on this and so that it would not raise any more than two and a half over the period of time that it would be looked at in five years? Well, we did talk about a five-year cap. But the problem I have with that is that we talked about this with a projected budget. And the task force took no ownership of that budget. It's projected. They don't know. And in fairness to them, how could they know? This isn't a rant or a rave against the DPW or the BPW. This is to talk about the problems that affect all of us. Now, the, the point about all of us is that there are 351 towns in, this, in, the, in the Commonwealth. Five of them, only five, have instituted this policy. Two of them have recognized that they didn't ask for enough money. We do not need to be the sixth. We do not need to get this to the city council by the end of this month. We need to vet this process. We need to educate the public. We need to educate our neighbors and our friends and anybody else because it affects every single one of us. It's about the common good. I have a question for you. You mentioned, this is a question for you, but you mentioned that we're the second oldest water system in the state. Second oldest flood control okay. works. We're, but we're the largest. 
one of the largest ones. Why aren't we requiring the federal government to come in and help us take care of the cost problem? Why haven't we gone to the federal there government and asked that question? There are many questions like that. No, I mean, I'm, I'm no, there, there are many questions, and that's a good question. Did the task force ask? I don't have no, no, that did, did you ask the DPW? I understand. I don't have that answer. The okay. issue that I want to bring, when you bring that point up, it's a good one, is we need to educate our neighbors and our friends and everybody around us so those questions get asked. I don't know the answer. We're making a little 45,000 people community Suffer the brunt of this. That's a, that's that. When that billion it's dollars for the common the good. Place. It's for the common good. You need this. That. I live in a, I live in a, sand, I live in a sand bank. I don't. I, every water, every drop that goes, I live in a sand bank. But in order to get to my sand bank, in order to get here tonight, I got to drive on these roads. Yeah. It affects all of us. Pretty soon, I'm not going to have a driveway. We need, on a we need to get people here. We need to have more meetings. This thing needs to be put off. So we can have these meetings, and when this brochure that we're willing to put out, it should have the meetings in there so that city councilors don't have to break break this down into small groups. There are a lot of things we can do. But we don't want to wonder either afterwards. We don't want to wonder, like, it's part of the budget and where about. the money's going. And that's what we're talking about. That's right. That's that's what we what want to know exactly about. every so penny. So I've said enough. <laughs> I do agree with that. We have to vote that. Right. I don't know. I do agree with Chris. I do agree with Emery. And you know what? I agree with the BBW. We have to do something. This is not going to go away. New Orleans can happen here. And when you can't drive downtown, and you think you live on an island, you will find out that you don't. We have to do something. The way we do it with is with informed public education. That's right. And that's what you should be demanding from the BPW, the DPW, and any city councilor, and any elected official that you see. Thank you. But we also Sorry. want the truth to come out Thanks. about the whole thing. And that's the problem, like with the override. So if you want to talk, get in line. Well, we'll wait for the mic. Let me just add a little bit about uh, the federal government. And, well, <laughs> I, I won't talk you mean about us? <laughs> you mean but, us? But, but basically what happened is I looked at the, at the dike and the pumping station and some of the stormwater system, and I, I talked to the people down at the pumping station over the last five or six years as a member of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, I went down and I think it was George Brown, the yeah. other director years ago. I speak to him, I sit and sit and talk to him about what's going on. <clears throat> and basically the the dike and the pumping station are in poor repair. And in talking to George and some of the people there, my understanding was that the US Army Corps of Engineers inspected the whole system once a year. And then when I talked to him again, it was every other year, and then it was supposed to be every five years. Nevertheless, how many, ever, how many times they ever inspected it, uh, when you see the results, nothing happened. So they should have been sending out an alarm, saying, hey, look, things are getting worse, they're getting worse. Apparently, no alarm was set off. So part of the responsibility, I think, belongs with the US Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government. So what I did is I went down to the governor's office, it's on Pleasant Street right now, and I talked to the uh, representative there and I asked about it, and the basic answer is they don't have any money. Yeah, correct. But so, we do. Yeah. We certainly do. Yeah, but, but I think the federal government does have a responsibility in repairing the bill. Um, I'd like to speak to what the gentleman said about getting people involved about going to these meetings. I first found out about <coughs> the stormwater meetings at the override vote when Marianne came out and mentioned something about it. And I said, what are you talking about? I hadn't heard anything about that. And they had been meeting since April. Can you speak up a little? Sure. So they had been meeting since April, and I didn't know that. So then um, the only way I heard about this meeting is someone forwarded an email to me. And I said, well, I didn't see anything in the paper. Yeah, well. Well, I looked in the paper and there was a DPW meeting, 7 p.m. Ryan Road, but it doesn't say what it's about. So I think if we do a better job of giving people more lead time on when you have these meetings and what it's about, I think more people would come because I totally rearranged my schedule <coughs> and put off a conference a day later to come to this. So, and I would like to get be more involved. In it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Every board, I live in Florence. I'd like to go back to something that, that David T. said, and it's this. I think that we ought to postpone and, and go at this with what I will choose to call all deliberate haste. I think we need to do it, but let's take the time to, to vet it so everybody hears about it. 
and to vote on this or have the city council vote with an election coming up and the current set of councilors to vote on this, which can have impact on the city for many years to come, I think is an unacceptable situation. I'm not exactly sure how we would go about postponing this, but I personally don't see any reason we have to go so quickly that we don't have time for meetings in every single ward to discuss this and find out what people are thinking. I don't know what the outcome will be, but I would hate to see this pass without a thorough vetting. And the number of people here is very small compared to the total number of people in the city. Um, I'm Cynthia White and I live on Lyle Hill Road and I'm new to the city as of a year and a half. I also am a natural resource planner. I understand a lot of these issues. I've been reading carefully about it. I do absolutely agree that something needs to be done. I do agree that it's going to be very costly. And I also agree that no matter who does it, whether it's the city, whether it's the federal government, or whether it's the state or wherever, it's going to cost taxpayer money. Just keep that in mind. Because it's all coming from the same people. No free money. There's no free money. And we, if we don't pay now, we will pay later. I do agree with the tier process. I have a very small home and very small driveway. And I don't feel I should be paying the same amount as someone else that has a larger property. So I do agree with that. I'm more than willing to talk to anybody about this issue because I care passionately about natural resources, I care passionately about the community and all the services that we are provided. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge. Um, I have to agree with David Chase. I don't mind going and having meetings on my ward. I don't mind going door to door and putting flyers out and announcing meetings being held in every ward. I attended three of those meetings on the task force, and it made it very difficult for me as a counselor to be there at specific times because it was before city council meetings. I was surprised that the only two people that I saw was one from my ward and then also the other gentleman who attended every meeting. I feel if you're going to do it right, let's do it right, and to rush this is the wrong way to go. I really feel that there is a way to do it, and that is the responsibility of every counselor to have a meeting on their ward. There's no reason why they can't do that. And I will challenge anybody who tells me that they cannot have a meeting on their ward. I really feel, and I agree with you, Cynthia, something needs to be done but we need to do it right. And I think we're in the wrong direction. There's no question about it by pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. All residents here and taxpayers in the city just went through that nasty override. And we need to take our time with this now. To cancel it, I think we should. I think we need to put the meetings on, start them this month, and take our time. Let the taxpayers who are going to pay these bills have the opportunity to stress what they feel about the cost or which direction to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Hi, I'm Jesse Adams, uh, City Councilor at Large. And I just want to talk a minute about the process because I think that some people may have gotten the sense that this vote is about to happen very soon. And the typical process is that um, a measure comes to the city council from various different uh, boards, committees, or other you know, certain people can, certain groups and individuals can sponsor legislation. So, in the typical process, um, the, the council gets a measure and they refer it out to <coughs> committees, and committees um, deliberate, and and it comes back to the to the full council. But this this of course is a decision of tremendous magnitude. It's of huge magnitude. And so I agree with that there's not even close to enough process, but I don't want people to feel like it's, it is going to get rushed and we're going from, from this meeting to a vote. It's not only going to go through those typical council processes, which I just described, but there's going to be a whole lot more. I, I, um, 
I will advocate for individual ward meetings. I think every Ford's and others' ideas is, 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 good, is, is the way to go, just like when we have overrides or other tremendous issues. I also think that um, what Mr. T suggested, I've always been in favor of having the individual brochures or notices go to, to homeowners' households. But um, but I don't want people to think that, that this is something that's going to happen extremely quickly. Um, and I do certainly believe that there's a room for a lot of process. And I would like to individually hear from everybody. So you can get a hold of your counselors. Um, our, our contact information is on the website. Um, but um, you, can, you can call us. You can email us. But um, I want to hear from everybody. I, I'm certain that other counselors do as well. And this is, we're not going to vote on this right away. There is going to be a long, more involved process. So thank you. So I think we've come to the end of the allotted uh, meeting. I want to thank everyone, genuinely thank everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.